The End of Year Awards Part 2. Ten. Hello, my name is Matt Mayer, aka Imp, and this is LOP Radio on YouTube, or Imp's LOP Radio Adventure if you're listening live in podcast form. This week is once again all about the memories of 2019 as we look back at over the year at the greatest hits and the lowest of the lows. Uh, once again, these awards are all WWE centric, with AEW still being a baby. I don't bit harsh to give it like really negative awards, but of course it's short term, so I'm not really going to include it in the whole of the year awards. And this, if I included other promotions like New Japan and Impact or whatever, then suddenly this show takes forever. <laughs> and this is not going to be the Lord of the Rings epic. This is just nice and concise. Try and keep it under an hour, blast through everything. I will be going through each award, explain exactly what it's for, go through the nominees and pick my personal favourite. Uh, you can all do the same in the comments below or hit me up on Twitter at the damn Implicat or on the Lords of Pain site itself. You can also use the hashtag LOP Radio. I now and then check it. <laughs> I need to get better at that. I need to check that. Tonight, I've got six more awards for you. I did a show last week, which was, I guess, the Undercard Awards. The more, I was going to say, the more fun kind of humorous type of ones, like the most nonsensical moment of the year, where I couldn't stop laughing whilst talking about Cedric Alexander revealing himself as the janitor. It was a lot of... <laughs> it was a fun show. Tonight is the more important stuff. The main events. The biggest ones, though, male wrestler of the year, female wrestler of the year, uh, got match of the year, and then worst match, worst storyline, and, of course, the feud of the year as well. So it's six where they're all the main event, the, the big ones throughout the year. What was the best? We'll notice I've not done a, like, worst wrestler of the year. Because especially in WWE's environment, a lot of that can hinge on the creative side. And for me, it doesn't really make sense to give a worst wrestler of the year to something which, to a world that hinges so heavily on the creative of which they have no control, or the production of which they have no control. So, yeah, I feel like that would be a little bit harsh. So really, it's just praise for the wrestlers. But yes, six to get through, so I might as well battle them all. Uh, before I do, just want to give a quick shout out to all the other shows here on LP Radio. We've got a show every single day that comes out, so if you want to go check those out. I've done my best to upload Dynamite After Dark every single week. I'm going to start getting back on Sports Entertainment is Dead, getting up on the YouTube channel. Everything available is available in podcast form. And this Sunday, I will be live immediately after Tables, Ladders and Chairs to talk about the pay-per-view as soon as it's finished. Yes, you can tell by my voice, I'm English. That show finishes at like half past three in the morning for me. That's on a good night. <laughs> Survivor Series was a good night. That was half three. On a bad night, you're looking at after four. So, yeah, I prefer the three o'clock finishes. They're nice. and nice, concise the hours. But yeah, so I'll be live immediately after that if you want to tune in for that as well. But this is the end of your award, celebrating all the good and the bad. Don't forget to listen to the first part of this. If you do, you might accidentally get a few spoilers for these awards because I did let slip. Like, what are what kind of the mo some of my favourite moments while I was talking about the other stuff? With six awards, that does take time. So let's, I don't want this show to be too long, so let's get straight into it. The first award of the night, starting off with a big one. The Male Wrestler of the Year. So six nominees I've whittled this down to. Uh, again, all WWE. Nominee num so we've got Seth Rollins, Daniel Bryan, Kofi Kingston, AJ Styles, Rey Mysterio, and The Fiend, Bray Wyatt. They are my six nominees. So one more. Seth Rollins, Daniel Bryan, Kofi Kingston, AJ Styles, Rey Mysterio, The Fiend, Bray Wyatt. Uh, so I guess... A quick explanation for why I've included them, because <laughs> I wouldn't be surprised if a few of you are questioning some of my choices. Again, these are all my personal awards that have been voted. There will be an official uh, Lords of Pain, I guess, end of year awards going up at some point in December. And the plan is, at the moment, for me and Sir Sam to do a special show on the, I guess, Sunday at some point in the middle or early January to go through all of those awards and announce them fully on Lords of Pain Radio. They will also be announced in text form. If you we got you, we got you covered. <laughs> We're not just going to do the one type of thing. It's like, no, be there in text. It'll be there in podcast form. Will I do a YouTube thing? Oh, I could make that a New Year's revolution <laughs> to actually figure out my time <laughs> so I can do a million of things, but we'll see. But yeah, so Seth Rollins, for me, for in terms of male wrestler of the year, 
obviously the Hell in a Cell match massively detracted him. I'm really enjoying his mat his work ever since really as a character. In ring, he was doing perfectly fine. He was having a fantastic year. Then he start his Twitter game started to get. Uh, I guess after the, when he became champion and he had his feud with Baron Corbin. Ugh. So from like January to WrestleMania, solid. Which pretty much accounts for all of WWE. <laughs> like from January to WrestleMania, solid. From I guess WrestleMania to whatever pay per view it was before SummerSlam, atrocious, <laughs> a bit all over the place. But Seth Rollins in that time was putting on fantastic TV matches, which is kind of why he got to the place that he is. And I've, I feel like I can't, I've got to nominate him for that. Those fir- that work over the first three months, as I, as I stutter over my words. And his work on television, I guess, through the summer of, I'll call it chaos. Like the two weeks of canon. That wasn't the rule for everything, but that was, when you watched it, you had to wait like two weeks to know whether you should care or not. And that's not a great state <laughs> for comedy to be in. But Seth Rollins, in that time, was putting on great TV matches. So you got like Ed Andrade, Rey Mysterio as well. So same goes for Rey Mysterio in that summer period. And then he had his big match against Bot Lesnar at SummerSlam. Everything th- seems all right. The matches against The Fiend weren't great, but the build on television was. So it's a weird one <laughs> where the matches, those two matches are like the big standouts for me. He had fantastic areas of build, followed by, this is interesting. Okay then. <laughs> so, my rest of the year for me, Seth Rollins, he easily deserves to be nominated, even though the latter half of the year. But yeah, for his TV work alone, even if pay-per-view kind of sours a bit, his TV work has been fantastic. So I've got to nominate him. Number two, Daniel Bryan. I'm not really sure this one needs much of an explanation. Daniel Bryan, easily the best, one of the best characters going into WrestleMania that whole season. His uh, pro-eco-warrior character, where he was like just going off at the fans, and him as a champion against Kofi Kingston was the perfect mix as well. His reign, very rarely in WWE do you get like a full... It feels like a full arc, as in when they dropped their championship, it was 100% the right time. They finished at the end of a story that was well told. There was no randomness about it. It started interestingly. It got Then it took, an, it took a swerve, which wasn't meant to happen in Kofi Kingston, but it was a way more interesting story than that, what they were going to tell. And they then told that story, like, amazingly, incredibly, beat for beat, it built fantastically. And their match at WrestleMania is nominated later in this list. Don't know about an amazing year. Even... For the, uh, I guess, feud with Roman Reigns, I guess you could call it, because it never really became a feud. Uh, that, I guess, arc storyline with Roman Reigns, Daniel Bryan, you could tell he was giving it everything to make it work. And, uh, like, you saw the reaction on Twitter, it's like, wow, Daniel Bryan, like, genuinely, it's like, you care when he's on television, even if I don't care about the storyline. It's like, that is incredible. Personally, I'm really enjoying his rivalry with The Fiend as well. So, and, of course, like, he just took, like, a month. I can't remember how long he had off, but that little time he had off was... The perfect to kind of reset and get back into things as well. Daniel Bryan, easy nomination. Absolutely fantastic work at the start of the year. And he's come back in with this stuff with Roman Reigns. Didn't go how there was planned, but Daniel Bryan was fantastic in that role. Whatever it was meant to be didn't happen. Eric Rowan got over to the surprise of everybody. <laughs> Fast forward two or three months, they've got him holding a basket. Of course, yeah, he got over, so that can't happen. <laughs> and at the end of the year, Daniel Bryan is killing it in his feud with The Fiend, which is currently in a state of mystery because I'm doing these shows a little earlier than normal because I'm going to be busy with New Japan stuff, so it's going to be a little bit earlier. But yes, The Fiend, Daniel Bryan stuff, I'm absolutely loving that as well. So Daniel Bryan, easy nomination. Kofi Kingston. for it's, This is a slight odd one because of how he was booked, I guess, from the debut on Fox onwards, so it's been like the last two and a half months. It'll be three by the end of the year. For the last three months, he's gone back to the tag scene having solid tag team matches. And in terms of male wrestler of the year, like I'm not going to nominate Scott Dawson or Dash Wilder. Even though they're a solid, amazing tag team, they're not going to make the male wrestler of the year lists. Kofi Kingston from, oh, it's not Royal Rumble, but from the gauntlet where he replaced Mustafa Ali, like from that night where they had him go ages, minimum of 50 minutes, in an absolutely amazing display, and then ended up, he didn't win, but he won over the hearts of everybody watching. Sounds a bit corny, but... If you watch the match, you 100% see everybody get behind it. You can't help but get behind him in that match. And then they repeat it again. Then they repeated it again at the Elimination Chamber. Then they did it on the road to WrestleMania. Like, it was a formula that worked so damn well that WWE, I'm pretty certain, on the road to WrestleMania, repeated it like two more times. It felt like in a short span we had a lot of gauntlet matches with Kofi. But they did work. Then came the WrestleMania match itself, which, again, with all the TV work building to it, to uh, just make sure everybody knows how momentous this occasion is, about why it's not just... Well, 
They did it. The thing I loved most about the Kofi Kingston Daniel Bryan storyline, it should probably save this material for later, but I'm going in. <laughs> the thing I liked most was if you are somebody who was following, I guess, the whole story with the wider context of. Uh, the issues of uh, Kofi Kingston trying to fight his way through as an African American. If that storyline was there, however, it wasn't told so blatantly that like they weren't saying the Kofi Kingston never came out, or, or Vince McMahon never said you will, you are not in this position because you are black. Like he never said that. Kofi Kingston never said that he was fighting as an African American. He never said it, but the context was there. If you're paying attention, they told that story without ever having to say it. Say it, which for me, that's fantastic storytelling. They showed it, they didn't tell it, which is like the number one rule, which I criticised WWE for so much in Show Don't Tell. They did it in this feud to perfection, but with Show Don't Tell, if you didn't pick up the signs, then the feud to you was about a, I guess a somebody with a long career who's like fought for the company for so long, finally getting his opportunity. Both stories were being told there because the, the like the long term career of Kofi Kingston fighting his way I guess up the hierarchy of WWE that storyline is still in it if he's doing it as an African American whilst if you didn't see that storyline being told then it didn't really matter because he had the long term storyline of the career happening so it's like yeah fantastic like it's almost impossible to not get behind him in this story <laughs> it was so well done. Then he had one of the strongest, I, was, I wasn't going to say best booked reigns, but one of the strongest booked reigns of like, like of a baby face in WWE in quite some time, holding the championship all the way from WrestleMania past SummerSlam till the debut on Fox in October. Like He had a, like incredible championship run, which he would hope would be remembered for quite some time. Like In the short term afterwards, I say short term, we're now two months past it, it feels... Like, he got squashed by Brock Lesnar, immediately sent down, and his championship reign is never recognised or talked about or anything. Even though it was a momentous moment and his reign went on for absolutely ages, I personally would have never had him lose it. Just, just generally build him up. The, his issue, and why he might not win wrestler of the year, his main issue is uh, not really in how he was in his matches, but more he was never really given any storylines to go anywhere. And the biggest strength for like everybody else on this list, I guess aside from one other guy, is the story part to their, uh, I guess, kind of long-term stuff was a lot more in place than it was for Kofi. Kofi had his short-term story, which played on the past really, really well, going into WrestleMania. After WrestleMania, he just went from one person to the next until he got to Randy Orton. And then he lost to Brock Lesnar after getting past Randy Orton. So it was a bit... He had a su whole summer where it was just interchangeable... Challenger of the month, which was a bit of a shame. So he was booked strongly because he won, but I wouldn't call it well booked, which again is a massive shame because I feel like he should have. He for me, I like because of like the chaos of the summer where the world of WWE was so unstable. Like even though Kofi Kingston had had a, like a stable booking kind of thing, it really didn't feel like his feud had got going until Randy Orton. And for me, it's like they accidentally found a way to prolong his reign really well to me. I see different opinions online, but for me. Kofi Kingston Reign felt like it only just started, and I could have easily seen him being champion all the way into next year. Maybe lose it at the Rumble in time for WrestleMania, or even keep it all the way. Like personally, I wasn't I wasn't ready for his reign to finish, especially in the fashion that it did. <laughs> but yeah, Kofi Kingston, I simply got to nominate him because of his uh, strong championship run and the manner in which he won it in the Elimination Chamber, Fastlane, everything. yeah, fantastic stuff. Next, AJ Styles. So this is, for me, this AJ Styles, when I say AJ Styles for me, is at the bottom of this Male Wrestle of the Year list. That, it's weird to say that, because he's had a solid year, where AJ Styles has once again put out fantastic work on both uh, television and on pay-per-view. Whenever he's wrestled, he's been fantastic. But he's not been Male Wrestle of the Year, and I mostly would say it's because he's kind of been a bit lower down the totem pole. He had his matches with Seth Rollins, which were fine. Really, I'd, I'd, I'd say that's what AJ Styles' year has been. I would say he's had a solid year, but he's not really ex massively excelled. I've had any incredible four-star matches. Like he's had good, solid, entertaining matches throughout the entire year, but he's he never really broke that for me. It, it never, he never really reached a point of oh my god, this is amazing kind of territory like a few of the others. He just had a solid year, and it was so solid from start to finish. I was like, oh, well, if I'm picking a sixth person, I don't really have a choice. I have to pick AJ Styles. 
So that's why he's on this list. It's more of like a, I see you there, AJ, even if I'm not going to give you anything. <laughs> Sorry. Sorry, Alan. Uh, next, Rey Mysterio. This is a massive surprise to me. Rey Mysterio, for a nice stretch in WWE, was like the best promo guy every week in his feud with Brock Lesnar, in the way he built up Cain Velasquez, his uh, storyline with his uh, son Dominic. Like, Rey Mysterio, he's suddenly become a really good promo guy. What has happened? <laughs> this, like, if you talk to me, uh, like the me of 13 years ago, where I was an absolutely massive Rey Mysterio fan when he won the Royal Rumble and he went to WrestleMania and he won, like, I didn't even realise as a kid that he wasn't particularly, didn't particularly go down well. I didn't care. I was a massive Rey Mysterio fan. Uh, I absolutely loved him. But I would say I could easily recognise he wasn't 100% the best on the mic or like emoting what he's trying to say uh, like in the most dramatic fashion that WWE likes. Now, though, yeah, he's fantastic. <laughs> he's really, really good. To the point where they actively used him to help get over Cain Velasquez. It's like, yeah, Rey Mysterio has done a fantastic job. And then not forgetting his in-work uh, career as well. Uh, first half of the year, first guess quarter of the year, fine, then slowly built up. His matches with, and with Andrade went down an absolute treat. Uh, not long after, he's back into title picture scenes. And of course, as I said, his match with Brock Lesnar was fantastic. He's currently United States Champion. After He's now in a feud with AJ Styles, I think. No, he decides that Randy Orton and Rey Mysterio is th there, I guess. <laughs> but yeah, surprisingly solid year for Rey Mysterio. Like, I didn't think, when I was watching him in Lucha Underground a couple of years ago, I didn't think in 2019... I would be nominating Rey Mysterio for Wrestler of the Year. But here I am. <laughs> so well done, Rey. <laughs> a fantastic Lake Spur. He's, he's Shawn Michaels in all of us. <laughs> Great stuff. And finally, The Fiend Bray Wyatt. With the effect he has had on... I'm shaking everything. With the effect that Bray Wyatt has had on the whole wrestling world of WWE, like how no one else has shaken everything up like he has. Even though... His most recent matches haven't exactly gone down incredibly well. The character work, the interest, the amount of fans who over the course of the summer were kind of being turned off the product, who didn't really feel like they had a lot to get interested in, a lot of those fans gravitated to The Fiend. Like, so many of them got drawn into Bray Wyatt's cartoony character and they find realising he's more broken and monstrous than he's ever been. This is actually the most horrifying form ever when at first you thought, oh, he's childish Bray Wyatt. Uh, no, <laughs> he's absolutely demonic, he's broken. That I really, really liked. And so did loads of other people. And the fact that that one storyline, that one kind of arc, the slow character building, people checking in WWE like every week just to see The Fiend, kind of uh, sec like VTRs, their vignettes. It's like, yeah, that is, that, that's sh that you had something, WWE. <laughs> Of course, and then after SummerSlam, he was like the hot shit in WWE with the match against Finn Balor. Everybody seeing his entrance, like, oh my god, they have something special here. This is amazing. WWE thought the exact same thing. He said, yeah, we've got something special here. Then his match with Seth Rollins. For me, that showed how well they had done the build for Bray Wyatt. How over he had gotten. Then the match was a massive disappointment and it got an absolute outrage <laughs> of emotion. Uh, for me, it's because... I can easily understand it. Like me on the night, I was like, oh, I was so depressed <laughs> when I did my live show after heading a cell. But there's like wider context to that. But that shows that how well they had done to get fans to care about the character. So that when they did do, like apparently there were outside circumstances, but the what was given to it was a tad of a, a butchering by accident where it felt like this might take a while to get his momentum back. But then WWE like gave him all the fire at Crown Jewel. Like just type of thing of. You're going to win. Like, end of. Yeah, it's it's an interesting one. He has had such an effect on the industry. Absolutely massive character from this year. One of the most, I guess, influential in terms of the way the product has shifted as well. He's currently Universal Champion, and everyone he encounters has a massive character change. So he did it to Finn Balor, NXT now a heel. Seth Rollins, now on Monday Night Raw as a heel. Daniel Bryan, I'm assuming, is going to turn up as a bold lad. We'll wait and see. <laughs> the, the Return of the Dragon. Like, I don't know how many WWE fans will get the Return of the Dragon, but yeah, it's a, and it, maybe if he comes back as Daniel Dines Danielson, <laughs> that'd be uh, interesting. Like, it depends how far back the Fiend sends someone. You can easily go back to Daniel Bryan chanting "Yes" as a heel when he was bold. Uh, anyway, the Fiend Bray Wyatt, incredibly influential over everything. So, but personally, in terms of solid across the entire year, I'm going to give it Daniel Bryan. 
my per- so my personal pick. Of course, you can all choose your own. Be it Seth Rollins, Daniel Bryan, Kofi Kingston, AJ Styles, Rey Mysterio, The Fiend, Bray Wyatt. For me personally, it's Daniel Bryan. Again, his work with Kofi Kingston incredible. His work with Roman Reigns and Eric Rhodes somehow also really good, <laughs> despite everything. And his feud with with Bray Wyatt absolutely loving. Not forgetting he uh, the, the matches he had I guess with Kevin Owens, the matches he had uh, with AJ Styles, which unfortunately fell in a bad place on the Royal Rumble. But yeah, Daniel Bryan, incredibly solid year. Quite possibly the best WrestleMania match, at least, oh, maybe of the decade, of at least of the, I guess, this five, this generation, easily the best WrestleMania match. Incredible stuff. So for me, easily deserved. Daniel Bryan, male wrestler of the year. Shout outs to, I guess, everybody on the list. <laughs> That's going to get more specific on somebody, but no, yeah. Everybody on the list, for me, they did something in my mind to deserve to get on it. Right, next up. Fem- they're babbling along, not much break for anything. Uh, the female wrestler of the year. Number one, Becky Lynch, Charlotte Flair, Asuka, Ronda Rousey, Sasha Banks and Bayley. Uh, Bayley is in that last place AJ Styles of, yeah, saw you work. You're not going to break the winner, but I just wanted to acknowledge the fact that you've done some decent stuff this year. Nothing more than that. <laughs> and she cut her hair and everybody was just like, oh, she's Karen speaking to supervisor. I found that hilarious. <laughs> uh, but really the top echelon, I guess, weirdly. Well, actually, do I have to go into the detail about this, really? Becky Lynch is the man. She's the top star, the winning the main event of WrestleMania, winning the Royal Rumble. Incredibly hot in terms of momentum behind her and like just to take it to the main event of WrestleMania to carry that all the way through the summer to be a the, one of WWE's top attractions, top draws, to be on the cover of WWE 2K20. It's not her fault, the game's crap. <laughs> it's She had a fantastic year. This is a year that Becky Lynch, a female superstar in WWE, became one of their top acts. Like, she's just as credible as everybody else. She, there's a, like, on the 2K cover where it's her and Roman Reigns, it's not a male and a female, it's two equal stars. Which is, like, massive for women's wrestling. Like, this was a year everything got cemented. And now it's like, you can now launch from that with every, like, we're on a level, level playing field now. Now you can launch into, I guess, the next era. And Ray Ripley looks to be the person to really capitalise on that. So, yeah, exciting times. So, yes, but I'm just going to spoil it. Becky Lynch is winning this. <laughs> like, before I go to any of the others, yeah, Becky Lynch, she's the female wrestler of the year. If anybody else in their award picks somebody else, do let me know. Because <laughs> I were like, why? <laughs> why? How? I want to know the logic behind it. Like, why you wouldn't pick Pecky Lynch after this year. So yeah, for me, easily deserved. Uh, Charlotte Flair, she's one of those people where, like you see quite a few uh, folk on Twitter saying that she's being shoved down the throats. But for me, it's, she's really good. Like she did this last year where she's secretly behind everybody's backs. <laughs> Aside from a few people, shout out to Rich Letter. Charlotte Flair had one of the best consistent years, like the amount of incredible matches she had last year, like a match against Asuka, matches against Becky Lynch, matches against a triple threat at SummerSlam, matches against Ronda Rousey. Like Charlotte Flair had a damn solid year, and she's done it again. <laughs> she had a damn solid year once again. And she kind of like, she goes under the radar of a lot of people. I don't know if it's because she's tall and blonde, so when she gets pushed the way she does, people kind of see it that way. Uh, I like how she's lent into the heel character. As of late, her and Becky Lynch uh, kind of not really clicking together. I really enjoy that storyline as well. In the ring, extremely solid. Uh, made a better WrestleMania alongside Becky Lynch and Ronda Rousey. Like, Charlotte Flair, incredible. Next up, I'll go with uh, Asuka and Sasha Banks together in a little way, because they've had, I guess, somewhat similar, but like one wasn't actually there and one was, and for some reason just wasn't being used. So Asuka and Sasha Banks both challenged at Royal Rumble for the championship. I can't remember. Did was Asuka champion? I don't know if I'm being an idiot here. Uh, both of the matches, Asuka against Becky Lynch, Sasha Banks against Ronda Rousey. Fantastic. Uh, Asuka left with the championship and had... Wait, did she? I'm, yeah, she did. Asuka left with the championship and then ended up not defending it because uh, she lost it on the road to WrestleMania because they wanted all three of the women to have the belts. Which, But yeah, I was one of those people that didn't feel, feel like that was needed and he could have maybe done Asuka versus Sasha Banks or something. Just to, They were doing the women's tag team title shit, so maybe not exactly that, but yeah. I'm, I'm somebody who would love an Asuka singles match. Even, as much as I love the big, 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 <laughs> As much as I love the Kabuki Warriors. Yeah, Asuka is uh, incredible. 
uh, yeah, she had an amazingly solid year, uh, and it really just cemented it. As I said, Becky Lynch at the start and really was kind of left off in the middle, but by the time we reach the end of the year, she's again doing amazing work alongside Kari Sane as the Kabuki Warriors as the Women's Tag Team Champions. Uh, fantastic matches against Charlotte Flair and Becky Lynch when they get to go at each other on more. So yeah, a fantastic end to the year, a, a fantastic start to the year, and nothing middle for Asuka. Uh, same for Sasha Banks. Incredible start to the year for Ronda Rousey. Then the World Women's Tag Team titles didn't really go how people kind of thought they would for that little WrestleMania mania period. Then she dropped off the face of the earth. Spent some time amongst herself. Came back, had one of the feuds of the year against Becky Lynch. Incredible run of matches. Then jumped over to SmackDown. I've been doing fantastic character work and solid TV stuff since. Again, not her fault. And of course, when she's been on pay-per-view for a Survivor Series, she was solid. Uh, it's not her fault that the Saudi shows don't allow women, aside from, you know, trying to break that barrier a little bit. You know, whether they really want to or because it's PR doesn't really matter. The fact that it's happening, they are doing it, so it's not really her fault she didn't get a massive, I guess, uh, pay-per-view landscape to do more stuff in the November times. I don't know where I'm going with that. <laughs> Such a banks. For me, for the work at the start and the work against Becky Lynch, 100% deserved. And finally, Ronda Rousey. Again, her work, she has, of course she hasn't been seen since WrestleMania, but as Raw Champion, where she started the year still as like that babyface character and then went more and more heel in time for WrestleMania gets for the main event for Becky Lynch and Charlotte, that has to be recognised. That again, that main event, all three women felt deserving to be in that spot. No matter how tired everybody was, it's a shame that the live crowd is just knackered by that point, or hardly able to give much of a reaction to anything, even though the match is fine. It's a bit of a shame. But the work all the way to that point, yeah, easily Ronda Rousey deserves at least some kind of recognition for that. So, yes, award for Ronda Rousey. But, yeah, Becky Lynch is winning. She's easily female wrestler of the year, so congrats. <laughs> uh, it's just a shame about the next award. So, the first time I've ever done these awards where I've just nominated the wrestler of the year and about to nominate them for the slightly jokey, uh, not important awards. The worst storyline slash arc of the year. Um, you'll notice a pattern here that there's a distinct lack of the first half of the year. <laughs> a little pattern that from January to WrestleMania, WWE were absolutely solid. From WrestleMania onwards, a lot more questions started to come up. <laughs> so uh, you'll spot that pattern. But I've, only, I've limited it down to five, so I'm kind of proud of that. So, worst storyline slash arc of the year. Uh, I'm jumping all the way to after WrestleMania with Seth Rollins versus Baron Corbin slash Becky Lynch versus Lacey Evans. For me, Seth Rollins and Baron Corbin, if you saw the pay-per-views that they built to and the television was just substandard Baron Corbin top bad guy kind of stuff. Like we're seeing on SmackDown now, which for me it's just not clicking. It, weirdly, this was more grounded <laughs> than what we're seeing on SmackDown. But yeah, it wasn't clicking, and the pay per view buy, not pay per view buys, the pay per view, I guess, attendances showed that. There wasn't any interest in this. Becky Lynch versus Lacey Evans as well. It felt like a perfect time to establish Lace, uh, Becky Lynch as a top kind of star on, in WWE, but they had her kind of elevating a new star, which is really odd. <laughs> this isn't the first time they've done this. Like when Daniel Bryan won the championship, he started feuding with Kane, and it just was weird. Didn't really fit. It was the authority kid at that point as well. So quite a big difference between him and the guy that Daniel Bryan was teaming with. But, oh, sorry, I can't breathe. It's Christmas cold time. <laughs> uh, but yeah, so Becky Lynch, again, was a symptom of that, where for some reason WWE kind of struggled for that little period post-WrestleMania to kind of get the few that would carry the momentum perfectly. The, the reason I've put Seth Rollins and versus Baron Corbin and Lynch versus Evans Together as one, it's because this did end up becoming kind of one feud with Rollins and Lynch's relationship becoming public. So they, of course, had to do something with that. So they built to a pay-per-view where with them in their singles matches, it didn't really do very good numbers. Then Seth Rollins, they thought, yeah, let's do that again, just have them a tag team. Again, didn't do great numbers. <laughs> so what part of the last pay-per-view told you this was a good idea to go with it again, but as a tag team match this time? Like, no, didn't do well. Word backstage was uh, Becky Lynch especially. I don't know about everyone else. But Becky Lynch especially just wanted this to kind of end and just can't she just move on as a wrestler, not as a girlfriend of Rollins. Uh. But yes, for me this this it was the beginning of the summer period of WWE where things just started to wobble a little bit after a really solid WrestleMania, if a really long one. It started to get a little rocky over here. 
Uh, the good news for WWE is they were so all over the place that the feuds that continued over the summer, yeah, there was, I guess, a little bit more to them because they managed to not fall apart. <laughs> so there isn't really any long storylines or arcs to talk about from the summer. Because like month to month, often like, if you're talking about the mid-card, it was like week to week or two, fortnight to fortnight. With the, the main guys, it was like month to month or you're looking at like Rollins versus Corbin, which is like, ugh. But... The uh, one feud that did start towards the end of the summer was who attacked Roman Reigns? This is an odd one because the first half of this for me was blatantly made up as it goes bollocks. Like they did not know where this was going. As I said in like last week on the uh, show for the, those kind of awards, the angle was so clearly shot as they went that that they that they didn't even clearly didn't have time to like storyboard anything they were shooting or whatever. Look, this is doing amazingly well for silences as I suddenly realised my thoughts were all over the place. But yeah, who attacked Roman Reigns? First half, really blatantly not planned forward weirdness. Uh, second half, he seemed to find his feet and they accidentally got Roman Reigns, uh, sorry, uh, Roman over and they went with it and they did really well. Like one of the, again, one of the, I guess, pros I've got for WWE, one of the positive critiques is that they're really, really good at fixing something when it's when it goes wrong and this, this feud for me was that. They... For the first few weeks, it was utter bollocks. It was nonsense. <laughs> like, what is this? Eric Rowan 2.0, the way that they shot the initial attack. Like, what is this? This is badly constructed and then filmed, produced content. Like, it's not good television content. You can still enjoy not good... I'm not saying it's not enjoyable for some people. I'm just saying, like, critically, it wasn't well done. But as they did fix it. So that's kind of where my praise comes in. They were they managed to take Eric Rowan, who was surprisingly getting over. They went with it, and his match with Roman Reigns worked. And Daniel Bryan and Roman Reigns versus Eric Rowan and Luke Harper was a damn solid pay-per-view match. Not on my match of the year, but damn solid. <laughs> a really, really great match. Like they called back Luke Harper to have one banger of a match before disappearing. <laughs> so, yeah, like, Luke Harper's got a solid year in him. Like, he did some stuff at Worlds Collide. Then he saved Mustafa Ali's life at WrestleMania. Never saw him again all the way till this feud and had a solid tag match before disappearing again. <laughs> so he just came back, did solid stuff and disappeared. Like, good good for you, Harper. Uh, now, finally got his release. But yes, who attacked Roman Reigns? It's nominated because of how it started and for me so blatantly didn't have a plan. But then it did find one. So, yeah. And if it did have an end point, they changed it midway through so it doesn't really matter. But again, it's solid ending. I guess. <laughs> With Eric Rowan, he got over. That tells you how good it was. Uh, next up, uh, Brock Lesnar squashes Kofi Kingston. Easily, like, just just erased months of work and made his entire, entire title reign meaningless, especially with the aftermath and especially what it led to in the King Velasquez thing, which was just weird. Like, it was one of the things where if you're looking for momentum and the way that it swings, the way that Kofi lost his title in quick fashion, you're like, okay, Surely this is setting something near then. There's a reason that Lesnar has squashed Kofi in that manner. That he's not just going to take months of build of an absolutely historic title reign for all sorts of reasons. Not just like storyline in the company, but of course the massive social implication of what the story is they're telling. Like It's such a, a fantastic feel-good moment with a really long reign afterwards as well. But the way he lost the title was essentially... Right, so uh, that's the uh, that's the fun... That's the joking around done. Right, let's just piss off with the actual story you want to tell. It's just kind of like, oh well, <laughs> sucks to be black, <laughs> I guess. Like you get absolutely squashed. Oh, that for me that was ins insane to do it like that, especially as at Saudi Arabia, there was no plans to kind of capitalize on the momentum and have Cain Velasquez uh, really dominate Lesnar in some form of fashion and do it. that he shouldn't have. But of course that's kind of what the story they set up. The momentum told me the way Lesnar won, we should expect something at Stroke Super Show no uh, Crown Jewel. But Crown Jewel didn't have that. It was just Lesnar suddenly won in a very quick map-based wrestling match. And he's now champion. He's just gone over to Raw and off his pot. Like, in terms of Kofi Kingston, like, the poor guy. Like, that's not gone well at all. <laughs> it's just... I know he's back into the tag scene. and like When I do my worst-case scenario shows, which I'm becoming more, 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 more and more sparing, whenever I book something, I try and think of the idea of what could cripple momentum the most or destroy the run of a character? For me, the way Lesnar beat Kofi did all of that, 
it completely took away his momentum, destroyed all the months of work of character, and now he's back into the tag division. It's like, oh, that... And especially after he had the momentous kind of character moment of overcoming Randy Orton, like this stupid, stupid, stupid stuff. Like overcoming that guy who had previously been the ceiling that held him down, and he broke through to immediately meet the modern-day ceiling. Like, yeah. <laughs> you get us behind a character to immediately destroy them. So who are we meant to cheer for? Oh, obviously, the, the, the S.H.I.E.L.D. guys. <laughs> or what's left of them. But yeah. Not great. Uh, worst one I know for the year. Next up, Rusev, Lana, Lashley. Not my cup of tea at all. Absolutely do not. I've never cared for the soap opera stuff WWE do. And now it doesn't. For me, it doesn't really fit in this current era. It does do uh, internet numbers. But I'm not sure how much of that is people are checking out the segment every week. As much as people are checking out Lana every week. Because on the internet, especially sex sells. And I don't know... If I'm kind of looking at it with my slightly older glasses of that's what I've come to expect from the internet. So when I see Rusev, Lana and Ashley getting loads of numbers, I immediately start making the, those connections in my head. As if I don't think this is doing big numbers because of why they think it is. For me, it's I, I'm still on that thing of I reckon it's doing the bigger numbers because sex sales rather than people really like the soap opera kind of storyline the way it's developing. That's the way I see it. But I am somebody who was also tuned out from the very first week. So I've not got... i followed it on Twitter and seen it evolve. And like, seemingly every single week or every other week, people are saying that their segment was the worst of the show. But it really does come down to taste. And in terms of worst storyline slash arc, I so don't like the soap opera stuff. That for me, this is 100% in the wheelhouse of something that is not for me. And it's not performed well. It's, the scripts aren't good either. Somebody transcribed... Yeah, one of what uh, one of the I think it was a UK show when Lana came out and did her speech. Somebody transcribed what she said, and the script is awful, especially in WWE's writing, where it's um, on the nose. It's, I'm not saying that as a massive critique; I'm just saying that is how they write. Somebody would come out and tell you how they feel using those words. They will say something like, "I do not like you. I do like this. I don't like that." That is how they talk. That's not how humans talk, <laughs> but that is how um, WWE talk. They that's how their characters talk. They talk in exposition in a way. I'm not doing that as a massive con. That is just how they do it. But when power paired with the soap opera storyline, the two do not mix. We've got people speaking in that manner. That is how they talk. I like this. I do not like that. And then they're in a soap opera storyline like this with divorce and affairs. And it's playing off interracial heat, which is another uh, great note. <laughs> that it's... Yeah... For me, it, uh, this for me, I don't think. Uh, yeah, spoilers. This is my worst storyline slash arc of the year. But I 100. percent I'm just trying to get it across. The reason that I started there, I just want to get it across that I'm 100 percent aware. This is down to my own personal tastes, and on top of the fact that it's not written or kind of developed particularly well, that there was multiple things across the course of the year that were put in the same boat. But because this is focusing and relying so heavily on that soap opera kind of thing, which I also don't like. <laughs> then you put those two together, yeah. It's like it's a recipe for my hatred. <laughs> I don't hate many things, but I immediately wind this stuff now. It's not for me. I've said it kind of from the start, but I cover it for a site, so I kind of watch a little bit more than I probably should. I should probably I should be zoning this out completely, but I'll watch the odd clip on Twitter or I'll maybe not wind through it on one particular week. Because I didn't hear massive negative things. Oh, turns out I didn't hear negative things because there was another show on or something. And people were distracted. It was it was actually the same as normal. Yeah. Not great. Uh, final nomination. I've spoiled who's going to win. But final nominee is Reigns versus Corbin. And it's for me, it's all down to the scripts for Bound Corbin. Week to week television. It's crap. <laughs> uh, it's more because um, the way that Corbin's character is handled and the way that it's meant to be building sympathy, I guess, for Reigns... There is a difference for me between heat that gets me to boo the guy. Well, for me, it's Baron Corbin. He's done both roles perfectly, like back to back, which explains it perfectly for me. I was really behind Baron Corbin during his King of the Ring run. I thought it was fantastic. I even really liked his stuff with Shorty G. For me, it fit his character so much. And then after he won King of the Ring, he had that little rivalry, Shorty G. I thought this is fantastic at establishing both of those guys coming out of the tournament. Uh, King Corbin in his new King gimmick, and where. Where he's, like, everyone knows he's not actually a king, but he starts to act like he is. It's like, yeah, I like that. Now, 
We're at a point where it's starting to feel like Baron Corbin is actually a king and he's talking about having people collect his spoons and things. Like, no, he's actually a king. It's like, well, this is weird. <laughs> That's like the least of the problems, though. So, a perfect example. Baron Corbin as the king of the ring, like, during the tournament and just after he won. For me, that was great heat. I thought that was fantastic. Baron Corbin now with the dog food stuff and the doggy poop bags. That is not good heat. That is, I am I want to skip this segment or even turn it off. I think even one Smackdown I did actually just turn it off after watching that opening bit. So I just wrote about that segment <laughs> in my column. It's just like, yeah, they're written so badly. And they kind of, I see the point in them. I know what they're trying to do, but they're not written well. And they're not produced well when you're watching them on TV as well. Like this, the, the man of Baron Corbin kind of presents the script given to him isn't great either, which tells me that the direction isn't the best. It's like yeah, like if if that's the, I think that's the main thing that came up during his general manager term was if he's given the right content, he can be great. The general manager stuff just wasn't the right content. It was too big a push for the kind of wrestler that he is. But they seem to have learned nothing. I thought they had during the King of the Ring. But then you get to SmackDown and they're making the exact same mistakes all over again. Like, this kind of content doesn't work for the character that is in that position and the guy behind it can't get it over to that degree. So why are you giving him that style of content? I do not know. You learned that last year. <laughs> why are you doing it again? Uh, so here's Mr. Corbin. The reason it didn't win is it's more of a personal message of you learned all these things last year. Why are you repeating the same mistakes? <laughs> I don't understand. I thought you'd fixed it with the King of the Ring tournament, but you've gone right back into the same issues from Monday Night Raw of last year. Yeah. Questions? Hooray. <laughs> oh, I didn't nominate the wildcard rule, but it should be. Is it a really story? I didn't know where to put it. Is it a storyline or an arc? I'm not really sure. It's... Yeah, it was one of the, for me, the big storylines, like the million, we're into the honourable mentions now because I didn't know really where to put these, but the a million resets, which were like a story of the year. Uh, the first one was in December of last year, so it doesn't really count. But then we got the one just after Royal Rumble with the uh, NXT guys getting called up. Then you had the new era after WrestleMania. It's going to start here. Then you had the wildcard rule era. Then you had the wildcard rules going away. And now into this new era with the October and NXT is now like properly kicking into gear. So I like this new era, but yeah, the fact we've had so many resets, it's like, oh, it feels good now to have been like three months with nothing super weird in terms of the overall structure of the shows or something brand new that's meant to be a fresh start and injecting energy. Like, we haven't had anything like that since October, and I don't feel like we're going to get any of that until the Royal Rumble, which is... Like, yes, you've calmed down, you figured things out, you've got your direction for WrestleMania, there's no, oh crap, things are falling apart feeling anymore to the trying stuff out, throwing it at the wall kind of momentum. That's not there anymore. So, nothing but positives in that one. But Rusev, Lana, Lashley is crap. <laughs> That's the worst storyline arc of the year. Right, next up to talk positively, the feud of the year. So, I think I've mentioned almost all of these in passing, so I can blast through this award. Uh, Kofi Kingston versus Daniel Bryan. Ronda Rousey versus Becky Lynch versus Charlotte Flair, Becky Lynch versus Sasha Banks, Rey Mysterio versus Andrade Cien Almas, Kofi Kingston versus Randy Orton, Rey Mysterio versus Brock Lesnar, and The Fiend versus Daniel Bryan. This will come as no surprise, especially if you were in the comments of Lords of Pain last week. My feud of the year, because I did spoil it in there just flat out saying it, <laughs> but my feud of the year is Kofi Kingston versus Daniel Bryan. It's not even close. <laughs> that yes, absolutely fantastic from the start point where Kofi Kingston replaced Mustafa Ali and they did the gauntlet match all the way to Kofi Kingston winning at WrestleMania beat for beat, week for week built fantastically, got you behind Kofi got you to boo Daniel Bryan uh, again, the, for me the great thing about how they got you to get behind Kofi Kingston was more than just guy going for title it was, it was just the fact of there were multiple reasons you could get behind him and if you weren't going to get behind him for one reason, there was another one too as well. It's like it was it was built so damn well. And if you were the guy that cheers the cheers the heels all the time, there's Daniel Bryan. <laughs> he was one of the best heels WWE have made in years. So, yeah, well done. Yes, incredible storyline. Uh, Ronda Rousey, Becky Lynch, Charlotte Flair for me nominated because it they built it in. It was really convoluted and all over the place. Like Charlie from. Charlie, what's his character in? Is it Charlie in Sully Village? Well, it's Charlie Day. Where he's just doing the madman on the board, just connecting all the dots that aren't there. It's like they've convoluted all over the place. 
But they, they did feel like they deserved to be the WrestleMania main event. So at the end of the day, from the Rumble to WrestleMania, it did its job. I'm going to get some praise there. Uh, Becky Lynch versus Sasha Banks was an absolutely incredible return and solidified Sasha Banks as the heel. And it's the first storyline that really made Becky Lynch feel like a superstar as champion. So, yeah, great. Over. And of course, classic matches as well. Doesn't hurt. Uh, Rey Mysterio versus Andrade because there was a period of this year where every single week you got uh, Mysterio versus Andrade and they were all fantastic. <laughs> and the fact they were so good is that that meant that the week after they got put on television again or on Monday Night Raw as well because of the wild card or back on SmackDown. Just, yeah. It's the only feed on here which is solidly television but they were fantastic. So all the praise. Uh, Kofi Kingston versus Randy Orton. Wasn't a massive fan of the of the feud going into SummerSlam because they did the uh, the Kofi Kingston is a family man thing, and the only reason I didn't like it is because it was almost identical to the storyline for AJ Styles versus Samoa Joe from the year before. So that was like, oh! But after SummerSlam, they really led into the two's past together, like really strongly, and I really enjoyed the feud. Like, may not have been a massive fan of the matches on pay per view, but on television, Kingston and Orton built incredibly. So, like, all thumbs up on that. Uh, Rey Mysterio versus Brock Lesnar. As I brought up earlier, Rey Mysterio, for a short period, became, like, the best promo in WWE. What happened over <laughs> these last 13 years where that is the case? But, yeah. And his his work with uh, Cain Velasquez, I may, uh, people may not have liked Velasquez versus Lesnar, but it did introduce Mysterio to Lesnar and connect them really strongly. And Mysterio versus Lesnar at Survivor Series then made a lot of sense. And the build to that was also great as well. It felt like... It was one long, massive build to Rey Mysterio vs. Lesnar Survivor Series. Fantastic stuff. So if I incorporate Velasquez into that, then yeah, it's great. It worked. And finally, and maybe jumping the gun, because it's not the end of the year yet, and we've got The Fiend versus The Miz as part of it happening at TLC. But my final feud of the year is The Fiend versus Daniel Bryan. Maybe they'll end the year with us finally seeing Daniel Bryan. I don't know how long he's going to be out for. It could be at TLC, where he would turn... In some fashion, as bold Brian Daniel. No, I was going <laughs> to come up with a pun on the spot, but I'm not Clive from Mickey and Clive Show. <laughs> so I won't do that. But yeah, The Fiend, which is Daniel Bryan, has got so many layers to it, and it's just like The Fiend gets over all from the year. The thing that I love the most about the character, it's not just the horrifying aspect, it's not the, the way they've incorporated horror movies into a character, it's the fact that everything about his past has become relevant. Which then, it makes the whole world lived in. Like, suddenly, everything that's happened to him is relevant from the very beginning to now. Which, in WWE, they kind of bring up stuff when they want to kind of make it relevant, rather than, no, everything is relevant here, and The Fiend telling Daniel Bryan, you know what you did, and every single person that he's in, that The Fiend is interactive with has reverted back to, like, a former past version of themselves, where they were, didn't really have everything together, or they weren't this huge hero that everybody cheered. Daniel Bryan... He was the opposite. He was a heel, and then the fiend turned him into the yes movement, and then he's like cut his hair out as the new face on SmackDown Live, <laughs> or for the Fabry Fun House. Ah, but yeah, the fiend was Danny Bryan. Been building incredibly, especially with Danny Bryan's resistance and the fiend pushing him and, and just showing how crazy he is. Uh, the match at Survivor Series, I wouldn't call the match Survivor Series a absolute classic, but storyline wise, built on stuff incredibly, led to the next moments incredibly well. Like, the story beats in it were brilliant. The the callbacks in it just added to that fantastically. It's just a... Yeah. Yeah, the matches themselves, I'm not a massive fan of the... If I'm making it as a, like, what were the matches of the year? Yeah, Fiend... Fiend, uh, the, the, Fiend versus Brian will not be a match of the year. But it will be on my stories of the year. Which, so that's why it's here. But yes, Kofi Kingston versus Danny Bryan. Yeah. Danny Bryan... It, Fantastic. <laughs> One of the best angles WWE have done in years. Uh, tell me if you agree. But yeah, Kingston Dam- Dam- amazing. I can't speak tonight. I don't know if it's because I'm knackered. <laughs> what, it's Christmas season to be jolly. Is it the beers I've had earlier? Yeah, I've been stuttering all over this show. <laughs> so what of me. Uh, next up, the two final awards. So let's do the fun negative one before jumping into the serious one. The worst match of the year. Uh, only four nominations because there's a lot of mediocre stuff. You can't really separate the mediocre stuff. And a lot of the, we do we do read today. The actual in-ring wrestlers, like the wrestlers, are fantastic in the ring, and it's the kind of the storylines of production world around them that I have kind of criticised. But the actual matches themselves, yeah, the wrestlers are fine. 
So I can't put fine on worst match of the year. <laughs> like, or because AJ Styles didn't have a five star match, I can't put his pre show match with Cedric on here or something like that. Or just his perfectly fine matches against Seth Rollins or whatever. Like, yeah, he's had fine matches. They're not bad. I can't put them on this list. They have to be actively bad or hindering or something for me to put them on this list. So you may be able to guess a few of them from that. So, nominee number one in chronological order, these are. Number one, the. Undertaker versus Bill Golbo from Super Showdown. That was this year. <laughs> oh dear. Uh, number two, the Hell in a Cell match. Seth Rollins versus The Fiend for the WWE Universal Championship at Hell in a Cell. Uh, next up, Kofi Kingston defending against Brock Lesnar, the WWE Championship match from SmackDown's debut on Fox. And Brock Lesnar versus Cain Velasquez for the WWE Championship at Crown Jewel. So... I guess the other add-on for me is I'm not a massive MMA fan. Uh, my brother is a big MMA fan, so I've seen quite a bit of it. It's just not my huge cup of tea. But I have learned that, for me, MMA in wrestling, when they do that kind of style, it's not for me. I find it boring as hell. I tune out, I stop watching. But as if it came for Lasquez, oh, he's got to warn Vince about the dangers of Anokiism. <laughs> oh, dear. <laughs> oh, that... It's, that's, the, that's the one tale of Antonio Inoki in New Japan for wrestling in the dark ages of New Japan in the 2000s. Wrestling fans didn't want to watch fake MMA stuff. MMA fans didn't want to watch fake fighting as in wrestling. Who is this for? <laughs> in America, I will say the demographics, co- uh, they kind of cross over a lot more than they, I guess, did in early noughties uh, Japan. But still... That's the lesson of Anokiism. <laughs> Which is why I'm just warning every uh, Vince of the dangers of Anokiism. Like, really, really, Vince? <laughs> just be careful. It, you, there is evidence in this industry that this might not work long term. You'll turn a fair few people off, or you it doesn't matter. But that's not the worst match. Uh, it's, just, it's, just, it's just there as a little kind of jokey Anoki. <laughs> yeah, Undertaker versus Goldberg. Easily my match, worst match of the year. Seth Rollins versus The Fiend. I feel like I'd be harsh giving it because of the concussions uh, uh, that... I can't think of the word. The concussion that Bray Wyatt had. That it feels like it wouldn't be fair to do that and they made it up on the spot. It wasn't good. It really didn't capitalise on momentum at all. But Undertaker versus Goldberg was like a stain, essentially. And it made people like me, who actively don't watch the Saudi Arabia shows, it kind of gave... it. It's reaffirmed my decision to not do that. It's just like, yeah, if you're wanting like a casual fan like me to tune in to the Saudi Arabia shows, it's not going to happen with matches like that. <laughs> but they're not for me. But it kind of reaffirmed. If yeah, Seth Rollins versus the Fiends, they at least performed the moves well. <laughs> um, it may be seen that the sequence of events may not have been to everybody's tastes, including mine, but they at least did the moves well. Undertaker versus Goldberg didn't manage that. <laughs> they didn't even do the move to a decent level. Easily worst match of the year. It's not even close. I've said that with a lot of these awards. There's seemingly like a lot of years I really struggle with who's going to be my best, but this year for almost like every award, there's one thing that sticks out. Right, finally, match of the year. I have got. Let me just count: one, two, three, four, five, six. I've got seven. Well, that's a good sign. Seven candidates for match of the year. This is this is with me trimming down as well. So, and this is... I haven't got TLC on here, again, because I'm going to be busy with New Japan stuff, so I'm doing these awards over two weeks and then bashing on with New Japan. Becky Lynch versus Asuka for the SmackDown Women's Championship at the Royal Rumble. The gauntlet match to determine who will enter the WWE Championship Elimination Chamber match last between Kofi Kingston, Daniel Bryan, Jeff Hardy, Samoa Joe, AJ Styles and Randy Orton from the February 12th Smackdown. The Elimination Chamber match for the WWE Championship between Daniel Bryan, AJ Styles, Jeff Hardy, Kofi Kingston, Randy Orton and Samoa Joe at the Elimination Chamber. Daniel Bryan versus Kevin Owens versus Mustafa Ali for the WWE Championship at Fastlane. Daniel Bryan versus Kofi Kingston for the WWE Championship at WrestleMania. Can you maybe see why I felt obliged to give Daniel Bryan the Wrestle of the Year? <laughs> it's a bit of a theme. Uh, Hell in a Cell match. Becky Lynch versus Sasha Banks for the Raw Women's Championship at Hell in a Cell. 
And finally, Adam Cole versus Pete Dunne for the NXT Championship at Survivor Series. I said, when I said earlier this is WWE only, it's also, I've not included NXT either. I feel like I could put NXT and AEW together next year. At yeah, the Wednesday Night Awards kind of thing towards the end. That'd be kind of cool, I guess. I don't know. I've not, I can't predict a year from now what the industry's going to be like. <laughs> We've seen so many changes over this past year. Like this time last year, like, AEW didn't exist. They were all in other promotions. AEW as a concept wasn't a thing. Maybe in their minds a bit. It wasn't announced until January. Oh, must be in their minds by then. <laughs> I'm an idiot. But yeah, to us, the public, it didn't exist until after Wrestle Kingdom. Which, to look at the state of the industry now, that is kind of crazy to think about. This time last year, like no one, it didn't exist. And now they've been on television for two months. Uh, it's, yeah, kind of mental. But yes, but my personal match of the year, out of all of those, spoilers, it's Daniel Bryan versus Kofi Kingston. As I said, as I said earlier, as I said in the Lords of Pain comment section last week, I was going to really struggle to give uh, the awards to anything other than Daniel Bryan versus Kofi Kingston, just because of how well it was done across the board. Not just the match on the night, but the way they incorporated all of the build as well. It was a momentous moment, uh, an absolutely amazing moment. Uh, uh, just the, what it meant to everybody as well. It was incredible seeing the reactions of everybody as, across America. This was, and, and it didn't hurt. The match itself was amazing and was one of the best uh, WWE matches, or especially WrestleMania matches, in, as I said, at minimum this half of the decade. I'd, I probably would say this decade as well. And I put it up there against the like Shawn Michaels Undertakers, the Macho Man Randy Savages. I really rate this match that highly. It's a WrestleMania classic for all time, which. Even though I can be disappointed in the way Kofi Kingston's title reign ended, the fans will not let th this moment be forgotten as one of the greatest. That's kind of... WWE will promote the women. That's what I expect. When we come to WrestleMania this year, they'll hype up how the women main evented last year. But me personally, I remember Kofi Kingston winning the WWE Championship more. It was that big. Yeah. And I'm a skinny white guy from the middle of England in like the whitest area. <laughs> it's just I couldn't be more apart from that world, like across the massive ocean over here in the UK. So the things on my mind are who I'm going to vote for on Thursday. <laughs> but uh, yeah, and I connected so damn strongly with Kobe Kingston. It meant, uh, and I was cheering with everybody else. Like <laughs> it was, WWE very rarely gets that reaction out of me, but to get me in like that because they told the Kofi Kingston story so damn well and seeing uh, all, all the reactions of like all my friends on Twitter as well like, that was incredible to see but yes don't invite Kofi Kingston easily match of the year but solid shout outs to the others like there's a reason that don't invite in Kofi Kingston like that run from the gauntlet to Wrestlemania I've got four match nominations I don't think I've ever done that in these awards before where one arc essentially has had four match of the year candidates. <laughs> like that is a solid run. If that's a thing normally appears about. Oh, we should watch New Japan. They've had like this run. Oh no, these series of matches. Oh, they're so good. They're, like I'd nominate all three of them for match of the year. Like yeah, I've got four <laughs> for going against Dunning Ryan. <laughs> yes, loads of other people were incorporated in that. But yeah, uh, fantastic stuff. Because there's a very strong likelihood we might get Lynch and Flair versus the Kabuki Warriors in here. Maybe even Seth Rollins versus Kevin Owens. Maybe even, uh, I guess, The Fiend versus The Miz. I doubt it. <laughs> the, the winner gets to keep the in front of the name. But, absolutely solid match for... Uh, a solid year for matches, sorry. And, just pray... Really, this show has been an absolute massive praise to Daniel Bryan versus Kofi Kingston. Just incredible work across the board. I can't, cannot praise it more. And that brings me to the end of the awards for 2019. As you can probably tell, I am knackered. <laughs> I've been stuttering all over the place. In terms of speaking on a podcast, this show has been awful. <laughs> uh, I'm assuming most people won't notice, but for my own critique, oh, <laughs> I've been all over the place. Uh, anyway, thank you for listening through all of that. Uh, that's the end of the awards this year. First time I've ever done the awards by myself. I've normally roped in somebody, but I've roped in other people for other reasons this year. So, yeah, it's not like, oh, I couldn't get any friends for the thing. Like, no, I've booked friends for Wrestle Kingdom. <laughs> so, I'm going to be, from this point on, I am busy as F. 
because I'm on YouTube, I'm not going to say naughty word. <laughs> so, uh, from this point on, uh, every single week I'm going to be having a different guest, and I myself will be partaking in Wrestle Kingdom coverage as well. Uh, as I've already hyped, the official Lords of Pain or End of Year Awards with the sticky post going up on Lords of Pain, uh, myself and Sir Sam uh, will be doing a reveal on Lords of Pain on, I guess, the second Sunday maybe of January. We need to figure that out. So, please do listen to that whenever we are live in like a month's time. But, my schedule from now. So next week, I will be joined uh, once again by Jamie Donovan. But this time, the young boy will also be joining me. So it's Imp and the Kiss Boys. The theme will be rolled out once again. <laughs> so Imp and the Kiss Boys will be officially debuting uh, next week here on Also Pain Radio to start talking about Vessel Kingdom. Uh, the World Tag League wrapped up this week. So we're now fully focusing on turning our heads towards Tokyo Dome. No, sorry. Tokyo Dome. <laughs> it feels weird to say it normally. So if we're turning our heads towards Tokyo and start the coverage there. Uh, week after that, on Boxing Day, I will be recording with Sir Sam from Australia to continue the coverage of New Japan. Uh, January 2nd, the week after that, I'll be joined once again by Chairshot Radio's Ray Cash. Kayfabe Ray Cash. <laughs> I forgot his Lord's of Pain name. <laughs> Start losing. Uh, yeah, so Kayfabe Ray Cash will be joining us once again. He is a massive Tetsuya Naito fan. So tension will be at its highest <laughs> for Ray Cash on January 2nd when I've got him on. Uh, so I've, I'm assuming that that show is going to be really fun. <laughs> so that. And then I said, as I said, after that, there will be the Laws of Pain awards show as well. So the official awards announcements here on Laws of Pain Radio. Oh. So, this essentially was the calm before the storm. <laughs> this was me nice and happy, just talking about the past year, reminiscing, joking, uh, tonight bringing up the stuff that I genuinely enjoyed. Next week, the countdown to Wrestle Kingdom begins, and away go my numbers, no one cares about New Japan, but I do. <laughs> so I'm going to be bloody covering it. Uh, anyway, so thank you for listening to the end of year awards. What were your awards? Do you disagree with any nominees I pick? Have I missed anybody off my list? Do let me know. Uh, follow me on Twitter at the Damn Implicat. Hit me up on my columns on lotsofpain.net. Post every single Saturday. Hopefully that's the case. I'm probably going to like sag a bit over Christmas because most people get like more free time over Christmas. Oh, not for Imp this year. <laughs> Last year I was one of those people. I bashed out the story of Ta- uh, Hiroshi Tanahashi. Like I-, I took all of December slash a bit of January and wrote an absolutely massive column as a massive spider walks up the wall and you're a big brave boy Imp. <laughs> so the uh, yeah, I had time to do that this year. No, not at all. No, the exact opposite of that. So I might drop off a little bit, but doing late night or random time shows for uh, Lost Pain Radio kind of just help. It's out of the way kind of thing. Even though I'll be knackered, it's out of the way. Ah. Mr. Uh, Sam, I'm recording at like 9am on Boxing Day. We'll see how that goes. <laughs> That'll be fun. <laughs> Full with Christmas Day dinner. Ah. Anyway... With that, uh, well, finally, do listen to all the other Laws of Pain radio shows. Uh, we've got Dynamite After Dark, which will be up hopefully before this is up on YouTube. And we'll have uh, Right Side of the Pond tomorrow with their myth busting for the 1995 or new gen WWF because of slow in the second half of 1995 now. So I can't say 1995, just call it new gen. Huh. Anyway, thank you for listening. With that, I bid you adieu. Adios. Hey.